Um, I, yes. Great, so I might get started um, because we're right on time and we've got lots of fantastic content to get through today. Um, so welcome everybody uh, to the second of three webinars that UNICEF and WaterAid are collaborating, collaborating on together um, in the lead up to Menstrual Health Day or Menstrual Hygiene Day later this week, 28th of May. For those who don't know me, I'm Chelsea Huggett. I'm from WaterAid Australia. Um, my role is um, a technical lead on equality and inclusion and rights. Um, so on Friday, we had a fantastic webinar to kick off this series, um, looking at Leave No One Behind. And today's topic or, or theme um, is building knowledge and skills during the COVID-19 pandemic. So if the slides just pop up there, I'll just share with um, people a few housekeeping matters before we get started. Thank you. I just wanted to remind people just um, of a few courtesy things during this webinar. Um, please make sure your name is in Zoom. We'd love to hear who's here. So please introduce yourselves in the chat box. Keep your microphones on mute for the time being. Um, please make sure you put any questions or comments in the chat box. We really love to hear from you throughout the webinar. Um, if you're having technical issues, simply ask for tech support and we'll make sure um, or try to get you connected. And also the meeting's being recorded. Um, so we'll assume if you're staying on the call that you've consented to the, the meeting being recorded. On the next slide, we've got the agenda for today. So it's a really fantastic lineup that we've got for you for the second webinar. Um, the first speaker is Maria Holtzberg who will focus on the impacts of COVID-19, the pandemic on gender equality. So really looking at some of those big picture issues. Brooke from UNICEF um, in the East Asia Pacific Regional Office will then delve into menstrual health and hygiene in the context of the pandemic. We've got some fantastic speakers as well on the Oki period tracker, which I'm sure people have heard about before and keen to learn more. Um, and then looking at building digital solutions for and with girls. So really today is all about that link between digital online platforms and solutions to menstrual health in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I won't speak for very long. I'll hand over now to our first speaker to really help us um, talk through and think about the gender equality impacts of COVID-19 and the importance of utilising digital platforms. So it's my pleasure to introduce Maria Holtzberg. Maria serves as a humanitarian and disaster risk advisor at the UN Women Regional Office of Asia and the Pacific. Maria joined UN Women in 2019 after over a decade of working in Asia on gender, humanitarian action and disaster risk reduction with Save the Children, um, the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center and International Planned Parenthood Federation humanitarian hub. So since the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, Maria has been serving as the COVID-19 coordinator for the UN Women Regional Office. So we're really pleased to have you join us today, Maria. Um, over to you to learn more about gender equality in the COVID-19 pandemic in the region. Thank you so much, Chelsea, and thank you to WaterAid and UNICEF for organizing this uh, really important webinar. May I just ask a quick question? Are you seeing a slide? Hi, yes. Maria. Yes. Joyous. It's only been a year and a half of this, but yet the question has to be asked. So Maria, uh, maybe we are seeing your slides with the presenter notes. So okay, that was what I was going to ask. Okay, let's see if it's going to change. Um, if it will change if I do this. Um, hmm, let me try again if that's okay. Thanks for patience. There we go. Uh, so thank you so much. I've already eaten up uh, about a minute of the time. Uh, I am here and very honored to be here to talk a little bit about what the impact is uh, of COVID-19 on gender equality. So this is going to be a very 
big picture type conversation that will help you all to work into the, the more detailed conversations coming after. And it's a real pleasure to, to be here. I don't think what I'm going to say is going to shock any of you or surprise you in terms of, of uh, what we're sharing. Um, but one thing that we've learned, uh, especially since COVID-19 started, uh, is that disease outbreaks um, affect women and men differently. And this is one of those pieces where we talk a lot about in the gender uh, community. And we've seen, and the COVID-19 has underscored this, that the existing inequalities for women and girls and the discrimination of other marginalized groups such as people living with disabilities and those in extreme poverty has just been uh, continued and exacerbated. I just put on my, my clock so that I will be timed. So what we've seen uh, in UN Women, but with many other, in, with, with many other research institutions and uh, uh, sister agencies within the UN family, is that we uh, can see that there's been a reverse of the limited progress that has been made on gender equality and women's empowerment. And it, the outbreak has continued to exacerbate the inequalities of women and girls across every sphere, from health to the economy, to security and social protection. And this is what we will be talking about further today. Uh, we know now that more women and girls and uh, more people will be pushed into extreme poverty. And we know that Asia is one of those places where that is going to be uh, really the reality. And the economic fallout will be severe for women and girls. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about this as we go along. So I'm moving to the next slide now. So here is, a, a brief overview of what we've seen already and what I know that you have seen in your work uh, across different spheres. But we, we, if we start off with the increase of violence against women and girls and the key protection risks that they have experienced, we've seen that there's a widespread stigma and marginalization. We've seen that uh, uh, GBV, services have been disrupted or closed due to lockdown context. Uh, we have also seen an increase in, um, in seeking help for uh, violence, which means we are assuming that gender-based violence, intimate partner violence has increased during this pandemic period. And this has been evidenced by tripling or doubling or quadrupling of uh, calls to crisis hotlines. And this is something that has been seen in all countries in Asia so and around the globe. But today we're focusing on, on, on Asia. We're also seeing that some of the, and this was true in the early eight stages of the pandemic, that women are on the front line of the, of, uh, of the pandemic in the sense that they are the healthcare workers. They are the nurses, they are those that are the cleaners in the hospitals. However, uh, we know for instance that, that women are 70% of the workers in the health and social sector. So this is an important group. Um, and they, uh, their specific needs for personal protective uh, equipment, menstrual hygiene needs uh, were overlooked and are overlooked in the overall response. Also just psychosocial support has been has not been provided. Um, we then can move into what we're seeing over some of the key impacts. So if we go to the health piece, uh, this is where women as health workers were not being given the same type of support that they should have in order to be able to respond to COVID. Now we can talk about well, what does it mean for women's livelihood or women's life in the economic sphere. Again, women are disproportionately impacted because we see that they earn less, they save less, they hold less secure jobs, 
and they are more likely to be employed in the informal sector. And I will come back to what that, what that looks like. But they have less access to social protection. And this means that the overall capacity to absorb economic shocks uh, is therefore less than men. And a large share of uh, women's employment is in the informal sector. So that means they are part of domestic work or they're part of jobs that lack labor rights and social protection. And that also includes healthcare or having sick leave or unemployment benefits. Uh, if we circle in on being in, in, uh, having support in the informal sector, uh, these women work as domestic workers, as nannies within agriculture or supporting family businesses in crisis or they work in crisis sensitive sectors. And examples of a crisis sensitive sector is uh, hospitality, so hotels or tourism or retail, so garment uh, factories, but also garment uh, retailing, selling of items. And we all are living in this context now. We know that tourism is down. We know that restaurants are not operating to the same extent. These are women who are now looking for needing other uh, livelihood opportunities. Women may be the first to lose their jobs or suffer the consequences of the crisis because they don't have the social security. The other piece that I wanted to jump in on because I'm more uh, soon at time is uh, the, the interrupted access to sexual and reproductive health and menstrual health and, and hygiene. So we noticed this, that obviously provision of family planning and commodities, uh, especially menstrual health items are central to women's health and empowerment and sustainable development, but it has been impacted as su supply chains undergo um, uh, strains. We've also noticed that some resources for sexual reproductive health services were diver uh, diverted to deal with the outbreak. And this will uh, increase or contribute to a rise in in or increased unmet need for contraceptive contraception. So you and women, when, uh, within a week of when the pandemic was declared, you and women together with national governments and mobile phone providers uh, went, underwent uh, a series of rapid assessment surveys. Uh, and for the Southeast Asia countries, it was Cambodia, Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand. And after this presentation, I will put a link in so that you can read the data yourself. Um, but I will just say that what we've seen there, and this is where both men and women were able to give uh, input into what they, are, what they are experiencing as part of the pandemic. And what we know is that the hard won gains that countries have made in terms of gender equality have been lost and will be lost. Uh, we've also seen that uh, this pandemic has triggered a mental health crisis. Um, we know that women, that the increased workload or unpaid care work uh, increased drastically as uh, uh, families needed to take care of elderly family members or children. And while everyone stepped up and helped, women needed to help more. And among women needing to help more, younger, younger women needed to help more. Uh, this is another um, uh, slide that focuses on what the, the, uh, our research or our assessment had shown that women's uh, pay had uh, fallen uh, as, uh, the women's pay had fallen as for formal workers. And in those that were in the informal sector, their hours uh, decreased. So this means, and informal workers lost their jobs. So this means that, that uh, women have less uh, economic security. And uh, we are seeing that this is especially the case among registered and undocumented migrant workers, among garment factory workers, informal workers, and sex workers. 
And because women, and I have said this a few times, but I think it is actually one of the key essence or one of the key issues to, to think about when we're talking about the big gender equality issues is that women in these informal sectors with these precarious working conditions don't have access to social security schemes and they have an increased risk of both sexual and gender-based violence at all stages of their migration. Uh, they have unpredictable travel bans uh, on their employment and uh, there's uh, in, a lack of access to support. The other piece that we were noticing, and I know I'm moving into the last uh, last few slides, uh, is that the what we've seen is that uh, COVID-19 disruptive contraceptive services. So this is leading to unintended pregnancies. And uh, we also see that uh, what has helped has been, and this is what we're talking about later uh, throughout the session, creative efforts such as using mobile online applications to deliver contraceptives, SMS outreach and targeted family planning counseling to quarantine centers also helped to maintain or restore services. Um, we also think that, um, that, that we need to discuss and consider the uh, emotional, mental and emotional health of, of the crisis. The final slide where I will close is uh, talking about the access to technology and innovation, because this is something that we continue discussing throughout this, this uh, afternoon. Uh, women do, as you can see in this data, have less access to mobile phones. However, we also see that technology and infrastructure are the enablers of resilience to cope with shocks because they facilitate access to information, to employment, mobility, and financing. So in the context of confinement, as many of us are within our home context, access to technology plays a crucial role in enabling remote access to goods and services and provide with information to cope with both the physical and mental health concerns related to COVID-19. So I will end there and thank uh, you all for, for organizing this important session and really look forward to see, uh, participating in the rest of this session. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Maria. Um, that, that's a very sobering overview of how thank these gender you. inequalities um, have been exacerbated. Um, uh, through the pandemic, and in particular, the issues that younger women and um, women on the move or migrant women may be facing. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, really, these issues of lower pay, less coping capacity in general to deal with shocks, um, I think are good food for thought for all of us and, and good for us to be drawing attention to, as well as the opportunities to be able to use tech platforms and creative and innovative ways of reaching women. So thank you very much, Maria. Um, Maria, you'd mentioned that you'd be able to share the link to your survey, um, uh, the survey in the chat box, which I see you've just done. So thank you very much. And colleagues, if you have any questions for Maria, please pop them in the chat box. And at the end of the webinar, we'll see if we have, have time for a couple of them. Um, now we're going to take a, a closer look just briefly into some of the issues that Maria already mentioned, but with a specific focus on how the pandemic has impacted menstrual health and hygiene. So on the next slide, Kim, I think we have an uh, overview um, here. So I'd like to begin by sharing a couple of these top line takeaways from a survey that was done by our colleagues at Plan International last year in 2020. And as you can see from the slide here, the survey was called Periods in a Pandemic Menstrual Hygiene Management in the Time of COVID-19. So the purpose of this survey was to understand the problems that COVID-19 posed for managing menstrual health and hygiene. And this was done through a survey of service providers and professionals in WASH and SRHR, as well as, um, as, well as through uh, surveys and interviews directly with menstruators around the world. And the survey results that you can see here on the screen are taken from this plan report again, um, and primarily found secondary impacts of the pandemic on periods. So what do we mean by secondary impacts? Well, those are things like 
for instance, restricted access to menstrual hygiene materials because of lockdowns or supply chain disruptions, or perhaps because of loss of income, as Maria mentioned. Um, and it also found that prices at the same time were going up because of uh, shortages. Um, the survey also critically found less access to information because of school closures or diverted attention in the health system to the pandemic. So both things that Maria touched upon in her presentation. I wanted to also note that our plan colleagues are updating this survey um, through a one year on survey that they plan to launch later this week. So stay tuned for more results uh, from that. On the next slide, um, I wanted to just give you a quick flavor of some of the work um, that we've also seen in the region that echoes some of these points. And this slide is courtesy of my colleague Reza, is with UNICEF's Indonesia country office, a, a WASH officer. Um, and this is a survey that was carried out via U-Report with nearly 6,000 respondents last year. You can see that some of the impacts are very common, uh, like problems getting pads, higher prices, or prices, or lack of access to single-sex toilets. Um, but I'd like to note three additional points about this survey that jumped out um, to me. The first was that the survey really shows that digital platforms were a great opportunity for consulting girls and women and understanding how the pandemic affects children when in-person consultations are limited. Um, second, the survey found that girls were going online more for information that you can see here, uh, for information specifically on MHM, which underscores the opportunity of digital platforms. And then third, the survey also found that some girls were experiencing irregular menstrual cycles, perhaps due to stress or other factors. So on the next slide, I wanted to pick up on that last point, which is that while there's been a, a much discussed about secondary impacts of issues like lockdowns or you know, lack of access to wash services on menstrual hygiene management um, and menstrual health, there hasn't been as much evidence of primary impacts. So the meaning, um, you know, what happens if you get sick uh, with COVID? So, um, you know, there have been very few studies uh, that have shown whether being sick with COVID-19 causes more painful or irregular periods, um, although there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of this. I've only actually seen one study on this uh, coming out of researchers in China and would be quite curious to know if anybody on this webinar um, has, uh, is aware of other similar efforts. And if so, you know, please do pop those into the chat box. Um, and I think, you know, similarly, we don't really know the impact of um, vaccination um, on the menstrual cycle, if any. Um, and I think this just, you know, underscores also what Maria was saying about lack of attention um, to some, you know, critical women's health issues during uh, the pandemic. Now, the next slide is my last slide. And this here, you can see the document on the right. Um, I wanted to share with everybody. This is a brief that was put together as a collaboration or represents the, um, the inputs from multiple agencies. You can see the agencies at the bottom here. So um, of course, WaterAid and UNICEF uh, and uh, both, both of us um, you know, co-organizing this webinar series. Um, also uh, PSI um, Europe, WSSCC, um, Womena and others. This is a brief on mitigating the impacts of COVID-19 on menstrual health and hygiene. So it has tips for responding to MHH needs during the pandemic, um, working with different types of people and in different settings. So Maria, for example, mentioned um, how the vast majority of healthcare workers in many countries are women. And um, there are tips here for meeting the needs of female healthcare workers, um, you know, when they're needing to wear the same PPE, maybe for many hours, which may prevent them from managing their menstruation as they would like to. It also has tips for female patients, um, maybe for girls and women in very restrictive lockdowns, people living in camp settings, or girls and women on the move and others. So I will go ahead and put this link in the chat box. And I think now that we have over a year of experience responding to the pandemic, it would also be great to have your feedback on this resource and incorporate um, examples of your work in the next revision. So this has been, already been revised um, twice since it was published. 
Um, that's it for me. Now uh, we're going to shift gears to look at solutions for reaching girls digitally um, and through other blended platforms by hearing about some of the work that's been happening in the Philippines. And um, just really happy to acknowledge all of the work of uh, DepEd and the uh, many others in, in Philippines um, who've always been trailblazers on dealing with menstrual health and hygiene issues. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Sol Balane. Sol is a WASH technical officer from UNICEF Philippines who works on WASH in schools and early childhood care and development. She has a background in public health communications, research and public advocacy. And she's been working on various health related campaigns prior to um, joining the UNICEF WASH team. So for this afternoon session, she's going to talk about mainstreaming menstrual hygiene management in public basic education through the hashtag Moronico campaign, which has been piloted in the Philippines. Sol, over to you. Thanks so much, Brooke, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, so in this particular presentation, I'm going to talk about because the hashtag Marinaco campaign actually started in 2018, but now we're continuing onwards to it um, during the pandemic context. So um, the slides will reflect um, what we've done before, what is the context in the Philippines, and how we're continuing on with this campaign as we move forward in this particular context. So yes, uh, next slide, please. So just a brief background about uh, MHM in the Philippines. So girls hear and learn about menstruation from female relatives and friends mostly. Uh, and although the onset of menstruation signals the transition from childhood to adolescence, most girls do not know what their menses is really all about. So most of the information they get is inaccurate with myths and misconceptions about menstruation still abounding, especially in information scarce areas. So some of the examples we have is like, do not take a bath or avoid sour food or um, to limit your period to just three days, one should jump from the third step of a stairway or jump three times. So those kinds of misconceptions are still uh, prevalent uh, in terms of um, what the girls learn about menstrual uh, menstruation. Um, and then when it comes to teaching about menstruation, most teachers also feel ill-prepared to talk about it, uh, especially the male teachers who are not comfortable with the topic. Um, they could also not seem to break myths and misconceptions about menstrual hygiene. And then in in terms of um, girls, they feel ashamed as well about having their menstrual period. Uh, and the first emotion that, com is, that comes is fear. Bullying is also common, especially teasing from boys. Uh, and then the poor wash conditions in schools also pose significant challenges to effective MHM among schoolgirls. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, in the Philippines, there are no established ritual barriers that discriminate against menstruating women. Uh, menstrual hygiene and products are commonly promoted in the media and the menstrual supply industry. However, the industry and media have promoted menstrual hygiene largely as personality development, catering to urban and lower middle to upper class populations. This projection forms a veneer that hides the challenges of schoolgirls, especially those in rural, low income, information scarce, and underserved areas with, who faces um, myths and misconceptions about menstruation. In addition, there is also a lack of understanding by boys, uh, deprioritization of wash facilities, and the prevailing gender politics that trivializes the gender needs of women. There have been efforts, both at the national and subnational level, at promoting MHM in schools, but these have had limited coverage and been had been unsustainable. So the situation is called for the strengthening uh, uh, and integration of MHM into the basic education curriculum uh, for implementation in school governance. Next slide, please. Yeah, so some of the challenges that we have when it comes to learning delivery of MHM um, is that cultural notion that the discussion of sex and reproductive health matters are malicious and shameful, uh, and it has inhibited open healthy discussion, particularly in the learning setting. Um, the lack of enabling mechanisms for teaching MHM has not helped. Limiting learning, uh, limited learning management skills of teachers and lack of teaching materials inhibit the development of lesson plans and interactive learning in the classroom. Uh, so the DepEd's comprehensive sexuality education program holds great promise for creating a culture and skills for sexuality education, but its nationwide rollout has been slow moving. For the most part, lessons on MHM and sexuality are limited to science and health subjects. And moreover, the design of the K-12 curriculum sets MHM lessons 
So begin only in um, grade five. So at 10 years old, some girls have already begun menstruation. Uh, so they get the information a bit later and not before their menarche. Uh, next slide, please. So now we go into the hashtag Meron Ako campaign. Um, Meron Ako in Tagalog literally translates to I have, which is a common expression of Filipino women to indicate that one has a monthly period. Uh, and it's often said in a sad negative tone, which is like, uh, I'm unable to do normal things because I have. Um, so what this campaign actually tries to do is to turn that around and transform this expression into a positive exclamation of, Meron ako, or I have, and to assert that even when a woman has a period, she can still do things that she wants to do and be the person that she wants to be. So I have a period, I have dreams, I have abilities, I have parents and teachers uh, and friends who support me. Um, so the campaign enables such affirmation through a gender inclusive and interactive approach to learning delivery. The campaign generates tools such as lesson plans, videos, teaching guides, booklets, uh, peer education modules, uh, and school planning processes to enable teacher facilitation and learning management and pupil participation. So the hashtag Maranako MHM campaign began with a small scale pilot in four elementary schools in Northern Samar, Philippines in 2018. And currently the project is expanding to some 350 schools in Northern Samar with a set of distance learning tools. Next slide, please. So what has the campaign enabled? So the treatment of sex and sexuality as normal or natural promoted more open discussion in MHM. This has been promoted through the use of exact terms for genitals in classroom instruction and the conduct of a school hashtag Marinaco campaign launching day to celebrate MHM. The development of lesson plans expanded the areas and topics for integration of MHM beyond science and health to include, for instance, social studies and values education. This enabled discussions beyond anatomy and physiology to include gender identity and relations, child protection, wash practices, and provisions. Um, learning materials made teaching and classroom management easy and teachers more confident in teaching MHM. Peer education enabled outreach to younger pre-monarchy girls and school planning ensured school governance responds to MHM needs, um, which includes facilities, supplies, Okay, so now that we are in the pandemic context, uh, these are some of the challenges that the project faced with regards to um, COVID-19. Uh, this is um, one of them is the closure of schools meant no use for school-based MHM tools or activities that were developed, learning loss on MHM and uh, adolescent sexual reproductive health um, because of the contracted curriculum which deprioritized these lessons and lack of distance learning tools to reach pupils at home. So in order to address this um, a distance learning package, a hashtag Marinaco distance learning package was developed, which included online write shop for the development of lesson plans and learning materials, um, development of distance learning modules. Uh, we also developed, uh, we are also currently developing Quentoroan module for engaging parents. So these are um, two modules. So the child will have a module and then the parent will also have a module. And what it hopes to do is basically um, prompt conversations between the parent and the child um, with regards to menstrual hygiene management. So especially now um, in this particular pandemic context, um, most of uh, the, the, the parents' role in teaching their children really becomes prominent. Uh, and so what this particular module tries to do is to um, encourage open communication between the parent and the child. So it prompts the child to ask questions to her mother, for example, of how was your experience when you were going through these same changes on menstruation? How did you manage it? And things like that. So it opens communication between the parent and the child um, Yeah, for, for that. So this we're still currently doing. Um, and then still getting feedback uh, from, from this one. And then we also use the pre-COVID videos and print materials. Uh, next, please. So future directions for this. So we are uh, going to link to the Oki period tracking app, um, is particularly to adapt it to the Muslim context in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, uh, and in a South-South collaboration with Indonesia, who has experience already uh, with this. Um, and then we are going to have an impact assessment of the piloting, which is still currently ongoing. Uh, and hopefully we are hoping to have the particular campaign um, and the materials scaled up uh, nationwide by the Department of Education. So next slide, please. 
that's it. So <laughs> thank you very much for listening. Um, and these are our um, email addresses if you have some questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sol. This is really fantastic. Um, I love learning about the Moronico campaign and it's great to see how MH is being used as an entry point to talk about such a wide range of topics related to adolescent health. Um, and really, uh, you know, inspiring to see the testimonials from the uh, teacher and the children that that you that you brought um, to the webinar today. So thank you for that. And on the adaptations for COVID and some of the next steps that you have planned, I think that's a perfect setting the scene for our next presenter, um, Gerda Binder. Gerda is the regional gender advisor with UNICEF's uh, East Asian Pacific Regional Office. And she has initiated and been leading on the development of the Oki app, which you just heard about. So today we're going to hear a little bit about the progress that's been made since the launch of the Oki app in Indonesia and Mongolia last year and, and talk a little bit uh, more focus on the localizations and deployments um, that are happening around the world and hopefully some inspiration for everybody on the webinar today to uh, learn more and get involved in Oki. Over to you, Gerda. Thank you so much, Brooke, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone on this call. It's my pleasure to be back. I was with you celebrating last year's uh, Menstrual Health and Hygiene uh, Day uh, and was able to introduce um, a mobile phone uh, application, a tool that girls developed themselves to you, and they, they called it Oki. Um, today, I will just do a very quick recap um, of what it is for those of you who are not familiar, but I will go uh, a lot more into detail what happened over this year during the pandemic and how can we uh, bring the benefits of Oki uh, to as many girls um, as have access to mobile phones um, in the world. So if we go to the next slide, um, as Brooke um, as we started even this webinar, it was all about knowledge, knowledge around menstruation, puberty, uh, for girls getting answers to the questions that they're looking for is what's happening to my body during adolescence, right? Um, we also heard from Mary Sol the situation in the Philippines and it, it, it looks similar in all the countries. There's so many myths out there, if you can bath or if you can wash your hair or, every country every context has restrictions and limitations for girls and they don't know you know what is what is really um what is proven and what is um evidence information and then also it's very often and marisol also said that um in so many information campaigns um it's a very scientific language right so how can girls actually access menstruation information in the way that speaks to them that is to their questions. And that is in really girl-friendly language. And that really speaks to maybe misinformation or the shame and the stigma that is built up in particularly that context that they live in and the communities. So what we did about three years ago, we started um, working on this with girls, with a very open mind, right? And had girls um, in user-centered design processes tell us, um, how would they go about um, developing a tool, um, a digital platform that is exactly what they want and what they need? And it was an incredibly uh, amazing journey. I can tell you, we didn't expect the outcome that we have today. 400 girls came together, they discussed, you can see on these photos, they crafted models they explained what they like and what they dislike. So the look and the feel of this whole digital application was completely determined by girls. And so they also named that application themselves. They called it Oki, and that is um, a fun made up word. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a positive, uh, lovely, um, word that they like, and they didn't want it connected um, to periods or menstruation. They wanted to have something that's like a friend. So if we go to the next slide, um, they also told us so much about how do you build a mobile phone application that works for them? Because the whole technology world, too many things that we all do is built in a way that doesn't look deeply into what is it actually and how can girls access 
mobile phones, right? Many of you will also say, well, in the communities I work in, um, I can't see girls um, even owning phones. So that's where it starts. They might share phones in the family or with peers. So on this slide, you can see a couple of points, but there's many more that when you engage with girls and really understand and co-create with them, you will develop a product that looks very different to what you maybe find on the market right now. There's more than 200 or even more period tracker apps out there right now, but none of them has actually gone into any of these specifics that you can see, right? Um, are they built to very low end Android phones? Um, is it a lightweight app that works offline? What if the girls don't have Wi-Fi? What if they don't actually can buy data packages? So could they use their period tracker? Uh, does it give them predictions when it's offline? Girls also don't have the same digital literacy or literacy overall as often boys and men do. So what did they tell us? They wanna tap on the content. They wanna learn about their body by maybe that it reads it out to them. They told us how to do tutorials. So they have a funny avatar, a friend who tells them on how to navigate um, this application. And it's very easy by design to navigate because the girls themselves um, made sure that they knew how to um, operate it. And so for other girls, they would work. Um, we also want to quickly just touch upon girls might not have email addresses. So could, how could they go on Google Play Store? Uh, to download it and now we also have an iOS version so there's a link they could use to download there's a QR code they could scan and we're still working on a solution to maybe that girls can share the app by using Bluetooth. Um, we have in UNICEF adhered to the highest uh, to the digital data principles so there is no personal identifiable information girls are never asked to put in their Facebook account or their personal ID number. So when you use Oki, they said, this shouldn't link to me. You should know about my periods, but um, I want the data to be really protected. And I also want privacy. Um, so that leads, for example, to the name and to the icon. And when we look on the next slide, they also said, and uh, Marisol alluded to that, we want it to be positive, is what girls said. We don't want this negativity on, oh, poor you, and, and, and I have my period, so I can't live my life in a good way. No. Girls said, give us a colorful, an upbeat, an empowering and supportive um, tool. So as you can see, it's the colors, it's the backgrounds, it's avatars. Girls made it almost look like a game. Um, and that's... Um, they can change, you know, and that can be built out. So it has various features. And I think there's one particular feature that uh, many other online menstruation information platforms don't have. And that is girls have their periods, not every 28 days, right? We know all that. So they need an individual cycle tracker that has a prediction engine. Um, so if we go to the next slide, Yeah, so I'll speak to the prediction engine in a second. They first said, we have the question we want answers to. So we worked on the content together and the girls have various, the users of Oki have various ways of uh, learning about the various topics and questions they have. One is a factual um, way of learning about it, seeking out the information you want in a feature uh, of Oki, that's the encyclopedia. But then, when they use Oki, they can also um, have it more gamified in terms of quizzes, reminders, pop-ups. We made sure with um, experts, health experts, um, SRHR experts, that every information is evidence-based, but it's also in girl-friendly language. And it's very contextualized. So at the moment, Oki exists in, in Indonesia and Mongolia, and you can imagine that the myths, the misinformation, or things that what needed to be addressed is very localized. So on the last slide, I'll, I'll then wrap up with um, introducing Oki to you. This individualized cycle tracker is so important for girls because one of the number one question they ask you when they have their periods is always, 
am I normal? My period is irregular. My period doesn't come every 28 days. It comes every 24 days. And sometimes it's 21. So in Oki, we have a machine learning and prediction engine. And that one tells girls as they use it, as they track and enter um, about their moods, their bodies, their periods, um, they learn about their symptoms. They learn about their bodies and they get the predictions. And what Oki also does, it pauses predictions when your period gets too irregular. So it's not overpromising to tell you anytime when your periods might come, but it can pick it up again when it gets more regular. So that was a recap of what Oki is about. If we move to the next slide, um, we are now looking at how can Oki, together with all of you, with partners, um, stakeholders, um, and girls around the world, um, be deployed and localized to many, many more countries. So maybe in short, the most important fact is that the Oki app is open source, which means both the code and the content is available to everyone. So that means without costs, you can use it, you can build it out, um, and you can bring the benefits um, to other girls um, in other countries as well. And you heard the Philippines are already thinking of how can they bring Oki uh, to the Philippines context and benefit girls there. Um, we already have uh, last year had, uh, for example, the code has been used in an app of a girls group in Kosovo. It's called Schnitt, and they have included the period tracker function in their um, menstruation education tool. Um, Girl Effect is a partner who used our content to improve what a chatbot on SRH are now able to um, offer to girls in terms of menstruation. The vision is very big, right? It's for partners, it's for girls themselves to continue um, writing, amending and building out the OK code, the design, the features um, and the content um, to bring it to more and more countries. So on the next slide, you see uh, the next cohort of countries who have um, expressed interest of bringing a localized version of Oki to the girls in that country. Um, I can give you an example. We're currently working in Kenya with a local organization called LVCT, who are already consulted with girls and they already know how the design uh, needs to change. For example, that the avatars look a lot more like Kenyan girls um, and how the content needs to be built out. It's not just translating it, right? Um, it is really about making sure that it's culturally appropriate, it's age appropriate, and it speaks to those um, particular issues that girls face in the content. Now, this partnership with um, bringing Oki to new countries um, also is innovative because what we did is we used an approach that is very um, common in the private sector in, in, in businesses often use franchise licenses, but it's not so much used in a development context. And so we thought, why not try this out for the aid community to see if we can scale Oki um, to leverage and harness the power of so many organizations like yourselves who are on this webinar um, to help uh, bring Oki um, to more and more um, girls and more and more countries. So this franchise model means, and you can see that on the next slide, um, that um, in each country, an interested partner um, who is um, aligned to the vision of Oki. So it's the organization is committed to girls, has a rooted, deeply rooted presence in the country, um, is willing to adhere to Oki's privacy and ethical standards. That means not to commercialize Oki, not ever to charge fees to girls and um, keep it open source, um, work with others to build it out and also has enthusiasm for digital technology. It doesn't have to be a tech whiz organization, but these franchise partners um, will just um, get an agreement with UNICEF 
and then can start the process that you see on the next slide. And that's almost the last slide. Embarks in a short process um, to localize and deploy Oki um, in a new market. Um, I won't talk you through all the steps um, we have for each step to help our franchise partners, um, a deployment guide. Um, as you can see, the benefit is you don't start from scratch. You have code, you have content, you have experiences from other countries, but you still start with the girls, right? You start with consultations with the existing app and see how you will have to amend uh, design, code, features, and content. It should be three to six months and you should be ready to go and launch OK in that market. And last but not least, I would like to do a shout out on the last slide. Um, to so many incredible partners. Um, we call it the Oki ecosystem, who have in one way or the other already contributed to making Oki such an amazing success. Within months of launching it in two markets alone, we have 60,000 users. So partners can come from all sectors, from all sectors of society and from industries. Here you just see a small list, right? Um, we have uh, technology companies who did pro bono work for us because they felt like they want to be part and contribute to this. We have content experts who help uh, review or add and, and, and support content. We have the promotion, especially during the May, month of May, by so many bilateral donors, by national committees, by other partners. The telecom companies, um, are working with us on promotion as well and have other um, wonderful contributions. So with that, I'd like to close the presentation on the last slide with a huge invitation to all of you. Uh, please be in touch if you want to be part of this community, if you want to be part of the ecosystem, if you want to be a franchise partner or just contribute in some other way, we would love to hear from you. Um, because and now I'm saying our tagline because Oki is for girls and by girls and that's what we all committed to, period. Thank you so much, Gerda. This has been a fantastic overview of Oki, what it is, how it was developed by girls and with girls and how to get involved in the localization process. So really exciting to see all this. Um, thank you so much for sharing today and looking forward. There's been a few chats in the chat box. So in the interest of time, I'll ask anybody to put questions for Gerda there, take them in the chat, and we're going to move on to our next speaker, um, Alex Tires Chowdhury, who is a digital development specialist and has been working um, also as the product manager for Oki. So what we're going to hear about um, from Alex is a particular focus on um, this gender tech toolkit uh, suite of tools that they've developed as a result of some of the work being done on Oki and others. Um, Alex has worked for many years in creating digital solutions for women and girls across Af Africa, Asia, and Central America. And um, interestingly, for all of you who are WASH colleagues on the call from 2015 to 2020, she worked with the GSMA Mobile for Development Utilities, um, an innovation fund that supports tech-enabled products and services in the WASH and energy sectors, which she'll talk a little bit about. With that, over to you, Alex. Uh, thanks so much, Brooke, and hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me today. So as Brooke says, I'm Alex Tyers Chowdhury, and I'm a gender innovation specialist. I'm, I work with Gerda on Oki and um, other gender tech things. And today I'm going to talk about building digital solutions for girls, why it matters in the wash space and the menstruation space, and then introduce you to some tools we've created to help people build that based on our experiences working with Oki and some other wash, wash tech products that I've worked on before. So firstly, if we can go to the next slide, please, Brooke, let's start with a little bit of background. Um, digital solutions can play a really important role in helping to achieve improved water and sanitation for people. So there's all sorts of interesting things happening in the wash tech space. Um, there's mobile monitoring, there's smart water meters, there's apps for reporting problems to water utilities, or there's digital marketplaces for sanitation or hygiene supplies, or there's apps like Oki, like period tracker and menstruation specific solutions. But when we're thinking about digital solutions, why do we need a gender lens? And I think several of the speakers have touched on this already, already but that's because we need to think about what technology women and girls have access to and how, and we need to think about their digital realities. 
And the reality is that there's a large global gender digital divide in women and girls access to and use of digital technology. So globally, women are 8% less likely to own a mobile phone in low and middle income countries, and they're 20% less likely to own a smartphone. And this gap is much higher in certain regions, such as parts of Asia or parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And women and girls are much less likely to use the internet. More than half of the female population in low and middle income countries is offline. And when they do have access, they tend to use digital technology in different ways to men and boys, often much less often for fewer things and with much less confidence and with lower levels of digital literacy. So unless we deliberately design for women and girls digital realities in our wash tech or our menstruation tech, so that they can also use the digital solutions we create, we risk leaving these women and girls even further behind. So can I get the next slide, please, Brooke? So deliberately designing for women and girls and their digital realities in wash and in menstruation really matters. So I'm going to give you some examples from some work I've done and some projects I've worked on, on, on when it's worked and when it hasn't. So when you use a gender lens and it's considered, you get Oki. Gerda has already done a wonderful presentation about Oki and how it was deliberately designed with girls and for their digital realities. Another example of one that I've worked on before is a digital sanitation services platform in Bangladesh. So on this platform, users could request municipal sanitation services via the platform. Um, it was initially planned that people could, to, could request services via SMS or USSD or online via the platform. However, when the organization that was developing this did research into their potential users, they realized that many of the female users could, had trouble using SMS and USSD, and they couldn't actually read SMS messages or USSD messages because they tended to be written in phonetic Bangla in the Roman alphabet instead of the Bangla script. And they also found when they spoke to women that low-income women in Bangladesh tended to, if they did have access to mobile phones, they tended to only make voice calls because they had low levels of literacy and low levels of digital literacy. And very few of them actually had access to the internet. So the organization then created an additional feature for their platform, an IVR feature, which is where users can request sanitation services via voice, via calls. So it was audio only, and it was in Bangla. And so in doing so, they found that many female users, female customers actually ended up using the voice platform. However, if you don't consider a gender lens, uh, you lose them and you lose female users. So an example here is something else I worked on, a smart water tap system in rural Benin in West Africa. So the system that had been set up, um, set up taps in rural villages and people got water tags, smart water tags that they topped up with money. They tapped it against the tap and they got water out of that. But they needed to top, top up their tags with mobile money. And the organization installed hundreds of taps and found that no women in the villages were using these taps. And they were actually walking miles to other water sources to get water, not from the taps. And when they looked into this further, they found it was because women in the villages don't use mobile money and they don't have mobile money accounts. They didn't really trust it and they didn't really feel confident in using it. So they ended up just not using the taps at all. And another example that I've worked on is an app in Ghana. Um, for this app, water utility customers, they could report issues with their water supply or broken pipes or any problems with their bill payment directly to the water utility. But what they found was uptake amongst female customers after they had rolled out the app and promoted it was extremely low. And when they looked into this, they realized it was because they had built an Android app that required internet every time that, every time that they had to use it. And over 50% of their female customers didn't have an Android phone and didn't have regular access to the internet. So they couldn't use the app and they had no way of reporting any issues they had to the water utility. So as you can see, designing for women and girls and their digital realities is really important. Can I move to the next slide, please, Brooke? So despite, so it's really important, but despite best intentions, organizations often end up designing for a user base that's predominantly male. And it's often not deliberate, but it's because often people need a few practical ideas or steps they can take to make sure that they're designing for women and the female user journey as well which is why we created these tools based on our own experiences of creating digital solutions for and with women and girls, and especially in our work in developing Oki. So you can see the gender tech tools up there on the screen. They are a set of three tools. 
They are all under the umbrella of dig building digital solutions with a gender lens, but each of them looks at a specific different topic and they're designed to help people really try and include women and girls in their wash tech or in their digital solutions. So let's look at the first tool. If we can go to the next slide, please, Brooke. So the first tool is about how to build digital solutions for women and girls realities. And as we saw from Gerda's presentation about Oki, women and girls digital realities really do differ greatly from those, men and boy, those of men and boys. And if you don't design for their needs, it means that female user numbers are very low, women and girls engage less and they benefit less. And if you don't design for them, you end up with a situation like the examples I gave in Benin and Ghana. So this tool is designed to help people develop digital products that work for women and girls, as well as male users. It's designed to be extremely practical. So it has eight key, key tips. It has practical advice. It has things to consider, how to do them, and step-by-step -step suggestions. And it also has examples of best practice and examples of how other people have done them. So for example, to give you an example tip, one tip is about designing for a range of digital literacy levels and Gerda talked about this as well. Women and girls tend to have or believe they have lower levels of digital literacy than boys. So they can often struggle with more complex features within a digital solution. And if you have complicated user journeys or unclear instructions, you can often discourage female users. So the tool suggests some tips like creating very simple user journeys, using clear instructions, have your main messages at the beginning of your instructions so that users immediately know what actions they need to complete. Having in-app tutorials like Oki has that uses visuals, using signposts such as next you will and after this will really help guide users who are perhaps a little bit less confident. And then finally, using audio and visuals like Oki does to help users with low literacy. The second tool on the next slide, please, Brooke, is about co-creating digital solutions with women and girls. And again, we saw this with Oki. Putting end users front and center of the design process, it makes sure that whatever you're creating is relevant for them, it responds to what they want, and it offers an enjoyable user experience. But again, women and girls' needs are often not considered in the same way as men and boys, or they're often not included at all. So this tool, again, is designed to help people run co-creation co sessions with girls and make sure that women and girls are included. Again, it's designed to be very practical. It has eight key tips, things to consider, how to do them and step-by-step -step suggestions with examples of best practice and um, examples of how others have done them. And again, an example tip about pairing girls up with digital buddies. You know, digital buddies are often older peers with more digital know-how who can support and mentor the younger girls throughout the whole process. And finally, the third tool, if we can go to the next slide, please, Brooke, is about how to include women and girls in any digital product user testing. In Oki, we did extensive user testing at different stages of the design and rollout to really make sure that it was relevant for what girls wanted, it was relevant to their lives, and we used it to validate our design decisions and the girls' design decisions, identify any challenges they had, and uncover any issues. And this is really good practice in any digital solution. But again, what you often see is you see organizations or teams designing and testing with default users who often are predominantly male. And so you end up with digital products that don't fit a female user's needs. Again, the examples I gave in Benin and Ghana are classic examples of this. So again, this particular tool is designed to help people conduct user testing with women and girls. It's designed to be highly practical, things to do, things not to do, steps to take, and examples of best practice and how others have done them. And uh, one key tip for you, one example tip in there is about how to conduct user tests, either individually or, or, with, or in pairs. So female users are often less confident in their digital skills and using technology than male users. And they may be more embarrassed about any difficulties they might face and they might be embarrassed about asking for help. And this gets worse if they are part of a group in a test setting. So if you have individual testing in a confidential setting with one test in the room at a time, this often works best. But actually, um, in some contexts, for example, in Indonesia, when we were designing Oki, user tests often work better in pairs. It depends on the context, but particularly for digital um, products that may tackle more challenging topics, such as in Oki's case, menstruation. And so to conclude, final slide, please, Brooke. 
Um, hopefully, as we've seen in this session, there's loads of scope for digital technology in wash tech. There's loads of scope for digital technology in menstruation and menstruation tech. But we really need to be very careful and to make sure that women and girls are included, they're not left out, and they are also able to fully benefit from the digital tools that are created. So the gender tech tools are freely available for everyone to use, and you can find them on the UNICEF website. The link is up there, but I think Brooke dropped it in the chat as well. So um, please go ahead and use them. Thanks so much. Great, Alex, thank you so much. This is uh, super practical, fantastic tips on designing for women and girls in digital in both menstrual health and hygiene and beyond. And I think we were so keen to have this presentation of the gender tech tools because we know there's many WASH colleagues on the line today who are working on digital solutions, both for MHH as well as beyond. And these tips on how to integrate and include women and girls um, views, women and girls as co-creators um, and as, as you know, designers, um, product testers are really relevant to all of that WASH work. So thank you very much. In the interest of time, I'll ask everybody to put any questions for Alex in the box. And in the meantime, we'll move to the conclusion of the webinar. So in just a moment, I'm going to turn it over to our special guest, Ina Jurga, who is the Global Coordinator for MH Day at WASH United. And she's joining us from Germany, where I understand it's a public holiday, so we're extra grateful. Um, maybe, Kim, we can go to the next slide here with just a couple of summary points. Um, and, in, you know, so a summary of what we heard today, so um, Maria reminding us that we have, uh, that there are many gendered inequalities that are being exacerbated because of the pandemic and that the pandemic is also impacting menstrual health and hygiene and posing more difficulties for girls and women. Um, and we heard about digital platforms as an opportunity during the pandemic to be able to consult with girls and women and reach them directly with learning opportunities, such as some of the COVID adaptations that are happening with the hashtag Moronico campaign in the Philippines and with, um, with the Oki app. Um, so there's uh, loads of deployment and localization guidance on Oki, as well as guidance from the Gender Tech Toolkit. And I've popped those links into the chat, so I encourage everybody to take a look at those. On the next slide, um, just to set the scene for Ina um, talking to us about Menstrual Hygiene Day, I wanted to remind everybody that Menstrual Hygiene Day is this Friday. We have the final webinar in our series um, that being convened by WaterAid and UNICEF on Thursday, because we know many of you have national celebrations planned and events in your countries on MH Day itself on Friday. So the theme this year is action and investment in good MHH in the post-pandemic recovery. And I'd encourage you all, if you haven't already, to share your plans with us in the chat box or on Yammer for those of you that are UNICEF staff. And I've put the MH Day website here that you know will tell us more about. Um, in this really amazing little animation on the screen, you can see the menstruation bracelet and hoping that many of you will come to the next webinar um, with your menstruation bracelet, either virtual like you see here or in real life um, on your wrist um, at the next webinar. With that, Ina, over to you. Yeah, hello. Uh, very, very good morning uh, to everyone who joined. And uh, first of all, I want to wish you a very good week of menstrual action that you kicked off very, very nicely uh, this morning, Brooke and co. Actually, you started it last week, so uh, you have a week long of action. Um, I'm not so sure if I can share my screen, but uh, it doesn't matter. So um, I think uh, you're probably all um aware what's going to happen so uh, and brooke shared the website so on our website you find a range of campaign materials that you can use in different languages india india uh, english hindi but also the campaign material has empty space so you can plug in your local language um, and make it localized use your local logos and they're quite amazing around the issues of as Brooke said the theme uh, more investment around uh, menstrual for menstrual health and hygiene now uh, education which we discussed today fighting the stigma access to products and the menstruation bracelet and yeah I hope uh, you all join the bracelet action um, build it according to any of your local materials that you have we saw materials from strings any types of beads, paper, uh, lipstick. Uh, we saw really origami activities in, in some countries. That's uh, really, really wonderful. 
So, um, yeah, and uh, if you have, uh, as, as Br uh, Brooke said, if you have uh, events or if you want to share a picture, please, uh, please do that also with me. Um, two updates I want to share uh, very quickly. Number one is that we're going to host Studio MH Day again, and this time uh, we host it on 3rd of June, so a week, uh, almost a week later than MH Day, because um, this is the global broadcast live stream show from our um, from our studio where we want to share highlights what happened what happens on MH Day and we're not doing it on MH Day this year because exactly what you said Brooke so much things are happening there's different conferences there are different events and through the live stream show we don't want to take away your activity and rather report a week later what highlights we observed. So be it like great bracelet pictures, events with um, local communities, webinars, uh, et cetera. So to, I want to motivate you to share with me then your MH Day uh, events and actions for a chance to get featured in the studio MH Day on 3rd of June. Um, and my second update is a kind of a premiere. I hope, Brooke, I don't know if we are technically able to show it, but our Global Menstrual Hygiene Day video is ready. And this was shot in, uh, like, so we, oops, sorry. So what we did, Brooke, are you able to show it eventually? Yeah, 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 perfect. So what we did before you press play, and I hope it works, is that we, uh, invited all friends and partners to come together in a Zoom call, <laughs> as we all do since a year, and uh, shoot a little bit of a choreography. And um, yeah, I'm very, very happy to show you the premiere. I don't think anyone has seen it yet. So um, yeah, Brooke, you can press play and I hope everybody enjoys. <laughs> Menstrual Hygiene Day is a global movement of more than 700 organizations and many more individuals working together to catalyze awareness, advocacy and action on menstrual health and hygiene. Our collective efforts to end period poverty and stigma by 2013 are at a crossroads. How can we still achieve our goal? Let's hear from our partners. Everyone everywhere should be able to access and afford the menstrual products of their choice. There's progress. We see more and more companies offering period products, including in the Global South. There are initiatives that are tackling period poverty in our small but growing number of governments that have adopted policies and removed taxes on menstrual products. But progress is too slow. And to ensure access to quality menstrual products all by 2030, we need more investment and action now. We want every girl to know about menstruation when she gets her first periods. We want every woman to be able to make informed decisions about her menstrual health and hygiene. And we also want boys and men to be educated about periods. There is progress on education about menstruation. Over the past few years, more and more organizations have included the issue to their work and increase the scale of their initiatives. But the progress is too slow. To ensure that everyone has basic information about menstruation by 2030, we need to step up our action and start investing now. In 2021, women and girls around the world continue to be excluded and stigmatized for an entirely normal and healthy physical function. That is totally unacceptable. We want every woman and girl to be able to experience her menstruation as a normal fact of life and not anything to be ashamed of or shy about. Together, we've made progress towards ending period stigma over the last few years, but progress is too slow. To end period stigma by 2030, we need more action and investment now. Everyone, and particularly women and girls, need access to safe, private, and clean sanitation facilities with clean water, soap, and disposal options. People who use reusable solutions also need a place to wash and dry their products. Besides, public toilets, as well as facilities in schools, healthcare centers, and institutions 
should be period friendly too. There is progress in terms of access to period friendly facilities, but the progress is too slow. To ensure access to period friendly wash infrastructure for all by 2030, we need more action and investments now. And we must ensure that we leave no one behind. All girls, women, and people who menstruate. Those who are homeless, migrants, or live in emergency situations, as well as people with disabilities. Our message is loud and clear. Progress is too slow. To achieve a world where no woman or girl is held back because she menstruates by 2030, we need to step up action and investment now. What do we want? Action. What else do we need? When do we need it? Thank you. I hope you enjoyed. And with that, handing over to the chat. Thank you, Brooke, for the opportunity and happy MH Day to you all. Great. Thank you so much, Ina, for the opportunity to have the world premiere of this um, MH Day video in our webinar. Um, this is fantastic. And I just have to say, Ina, um, as the global coordinator, you've been such a wonderful and fantastic motivation, inspiration, leader. Um, you know, a really, and, and partner for all of us that are active in MH Day and in MH around the world. So thank you so much for joining the webinar today and, and sharing this additional information about what's planned um, for Studio MH Day. Um, and really looking forward to hearing from everybody on the call about what your plans are. So with that, we will close today's webinar with a final reminder for Thursday's webinar, since we already talked about Friday's MH Day. Um, I'll ask my colleague Kim if he can just put up the final slide. The webinar is on the theme of MH Day, which is stepping up action and investment in menstrual health and hygiene. And it will be at the same time on Thursday, just a little bit of a longer webinar. We really look forward to having um, to talk, talk about what's been successful in action and investment and having a special youth entrepreneur panel. I also wanted to share for many of you that are active in the DFAT funded Water for Women um, fund programs that there is a wash and learn event that's open, I understand beyond just the fund partners on the 28th on MH day, which is at 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time about uh, ending period poverty by prioritizing menstrual health and hygiene in wash. So looking forward to two more events this week. With that, um, a big thanks to our behind the scenes team that made this webinar possible, Maud, Kim, and Maria Dolores. Um, a big thanks to Chelsea and all of her colleagues at WaterAid for co-convening this series. Um, it's been a, a great working uh, to put these webinars on together. And uh, thank you very much for joining and see you on Thursday.